will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Though the seasons come quickly, you have always been love. Though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. And you are good. In the morning I sing, you are good. And in the evening I sing, you are good. You are good to me. And you have always been patient. You have always been kind. You're consistent through the ages. Oh, what a fan of mine. So I remind my soul to bless you. Standing firm upon your shoes. Knowing you cannot be shaken. Cause I've seen what you can do. Cause you are good. And in the morning I sing. Good. 
In the morning I sing that you are good. And in the evening I sing you are good. You are good to me.
nothing else fit for the King except for a heart singing hallelujah Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lot in inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. If 
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out. We pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, only you. Great are you, Lord, we declare that you are. you are great are you Lord good morning I had this really misguided thought that I was going to be really strong this morning, <laughs> um, but instead you're just going to have to bear with me. Um, uh, Marshall knocked on our door yesterday morning, and Cody and I and a few other people went with him to the hospital and we prayed for resurrection for four hours <laughs> and it was one of the hardest things I've ever done and it was also one of the most beautiful and I um, it was truly an honor to be able to be there and feel that level of faith and that level of love and I know some of you are going ooh this is <laughs> this is uncomfortable but it was an honor to trust God and take him at his word and do what he says we go and we do what he says and we don't always understand what happens but we do what he says and he says we heal the sick and we raise the dead and that's what we keep contending for and we keep believing for and now um, we get the honor of being here and carrying each other's burdens and I know that many of you today are carrying burdens of your own family members who are sick addictions that you just can't seem to fight <laughs> um, pain loss that you've faced and the reality is we look at the world around us, what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on, the, the fear that is in our lives and in our worlds. And we take all those things and we put them at the foot of the cross and we give them to the Father. And this is what I know. And I know, and I know, and I know <laughs> is that God is good. He is good. And he has made a way. And eternity is real and heaven is real. And today it is truly an honor to be able to trust God with you. <clears throat> We're speaking about communion today, but all week I actually couldn't, um, I couldn't get anything together for it. But, you know, I kept going to the normal communion verses but what kept coming to me was in John 6, right before, and, and John doesn't even actually share communion. I think what John did is he read the other Gospels, and he's like, I'm going to pull the things that they left out. So 
he doesn't even hit on communion, um, but what he does that same night, he, um, what he shares is something that Jesus did a little earlier. Uh, sorry, not John 6, John 13. It said it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening, <clears throat> the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. <sighs> Listen to this next part. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. And he sat there in the middle of his betray betrayer. And he knew... <laughs> And he knew what he was about to face, and yet it says he knew that God had put, his father had put everything under his authority and his power. He could have chosen to just, I mean, he could have snapped his fingers and Judas would have been gone. He could have never gone to that cross. He could have never endured what he did. But what's so crazy is before even that, it says... He knew all these things. He knew he was returning to God. He knew that God had put everything under his power. And then it says, so he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. I don't think we can fully understand communion or the cross until we understand that Jesus picks up a basin and he did the job of the lowest servant. Like at that time, there were many servants, but the job of the lowest servant, because remember, they don't have cars. Most of them are walking with little sandals on their feet and they're walking behind camels and they're walking in dirt and stuff. <laughs> I'm right on the edge, y'all. I almost just cussed in church again. <laughs> so these men come in and their shoes are, I mean, and these are Jewish, these are Jewish people and they're coming to a meal. And so being clean is important, but they would always choose the lowest servant to wash everybody's feet. And Jesus the Son of God, knowing who he is, knowing that all power and all authority is his and he's about to go back up to his father. Grabs a basin and he gets down on his hands and knees and he washes the dirt and the pee and the poop and the crap off of these guys. <laughs> And the question that I keep hearing that I believe God wants to ask you today is will you let Jesus serve you? And some of us, that makes us feel weird. <laughs> what? No, get to the other, you know, get to the end. And we all like to get to the end of this where, you know, Peter comes and he makes a fuss like he always does. And, and then at the end, Jesus says, I've shown you an example, so now go and do likewise, right? He, he says, go, and I've shown you how to serve people, now you go serve people. Obviously, in our culture, that doesn't look like washing feet. It looks like a whole bunch of other things. We all like to jump to that part. But I want us to sit for a moment in the part where Jesus does it first and where he does it for his disciples and where he is still saying, I'm here to do it today. And I think that a lot of us 
can live at a level of religion with God all our lives. We can come to church and we can feel really great about serving him. And we can feel really great about serving other people. But we lose the intimacy that comes when he, we let him serve us. When we are going through things and we go, I'm a mess. And every time we're a mess, we kind of just want to run and hide. But there is something beautiful in coming to Jesus and going, I just need you to wash my feet today. I just need you to serve me today. And I want to give you all permission today, whether you're at home or here with us. I want to give you full permission. You just let him get all that mess. You just let him serve you because until you're ready, and it's actually a humbling in us, until we're ready to actually go, yes. Because Peter didn't want to at first. He's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. But until we're ready to allow Jesus to serve us, we're never going to know true intimacy with him. We're never going to know what it is to, to truly become one with him as our Savior. Because actually what we make it is all about just what we can do to earn our salvation. Even though we know that the Bible says that's not what it is. But that's what we end up doing. And so today I want to encourage you. We're going to have communion a little bit later. But we're going to do a little more worship right now. And I want to encourage you. Whatever that looks like for you. Just let him heal your heart. Let him with whatever it is that you have right now, let him wash your feet. Let him wash off the guilt. Let him wash off the pain. Let him wash off the shame. Let him wash off the sin, the doubt. Let him sit with you in it. Jesus, <laughs> we don't always get, we don't always get it, <laughs> but we trust you. Jesus, thank you that you are are the reason we can have hope. You're the reason we can stand. You're the reason that we can carry each other's burdens. You're the reason for everything. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you made a way for us. Thank you that you are the ultimate friend who laid down your life for us. We love you.
You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Well, my sin was great, love was greater. But what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name. on before you you silence the bows of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life Death could not hold you, a veil torn before you. You silenced the bows of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ.
Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. surrounding me let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still every wave at your name Jesus Jesus you darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear oh Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus yeah. breathe call these bones to live Call these lungs to sing every rain. I will praise you, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. And you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. And you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus. And you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. And you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus. And you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. And your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny. And your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a lie. Forever lifted high in your name cannot be overcome. In your name is a lie that the shadows can't deny. In your name cannot be overcome. No, we can know your name is a lie. be overcome cause Jesus Jesus and you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus and you silence fear oh Jesus Jesus and you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus yeah, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, 
you make the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Yes, your name is a light That the shadows can't deny And your name cannot be overcome Your name is a light Forever lifted high in your name cannot be all a cup oh, 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 oh. your name is beautiful your name is beautiful more than just words. It's like you're warring with your soul. I'm freaking pissed at the devil, guys. <laughs> he is... He's nothing. He's defeated, and yet he just causes so much crap, and we have to stand up. We have to stand up. We have to. As the church, we have to fight back I'm going to share with you a scripture um, it's one I remember reading many times and every time I read it I go I'm never going to preach on that that does not preach well <laughs> in John 6 towards the beginning of Jesus ministry and he has his 12 disciples, and he has a lot of followers. A lot of, actually, a lot of other disciples beyond the 12. 12. And he's, he's teaching, and he's teaching all these great, wonderful things. He's just walked on water. That's cool. He just actually um, fed 5,000. So that's 5,000 just, just counting the men. So, you know. They, they assume it would be way more than double that. So he's multiplied food. <laughs> he's done all these cool things, and all these people are enamored and just following after him. And then he starts to share something great. He says, I am the bread of life. And these people, I mean, who doesn't like bread? <laughs> but even beyond that, like for, for at that time, like bread was a staple, right? And he's going, I am the bread of life. Like the way that you need food to eat every day, you need me more. And it's all sounding really great. And then he says, again, he says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, the Israelites, 
ate manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the Jews began to argue sharply among them, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus says to them, this is so great. I want, like I'm imagining the conversation between Jesus and the Father, because you know how Jesus says he does nothing without first seeing what the Father's doing? So I'm imagining this conversation, and the Father's like, hey, you know what you should tell them? <laughs> like he got all their attention, and he's like, tell them, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. Cool, Dad. That sounds like a great plan, a great strategy. I think that Mark Myers at the Unstuck um, might have a different opinion, right? Like, this is not how you build a church, <laughs> freaking people out. And he continues, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is the real food, and my blood is the real drink. Whoever eats my flesh keeps going and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father so the one who feeds on me will live because of me this is the bread that came down from heaven your ancestors ate man manna and died but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever But what's interesting is a few verses later, it says, from this time, many of his disciple turn, disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Because he said something super uncomfortable. And he says to the ones who are left, he says, do you not want to leave too? Jesus asked the 12, and Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, Jesus doesn't care about offending because he's trying to get the point across. I can guarantee that some of you, if you go a few hours without eating, become like my daughter Kayla, who is, gets real hangry and angry and frustrated, right? And, and then you go a day without eating and it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like it becomes your whole focus, right? You can't even think straight when you haven't eaten. A few days, a week, There's no way we'd become obsessed, right? We'd become obsessed with finding food. And yet Jesus is going, the spirit matters, the flesh doesn't matter. That's one of the things he says, the spirit matters, the flesh doesn't matter in comparison. And yet so many of us will make sure that we eat three meals a day, day with snacks in between. But some of us will go an entire week or two weeks or a month without ever feeding on Jesus. And that's why he doesn't care about offending us at all. Because he's going, I need you to get this. I need you to get this. That your flesh matters here on earth, but your spirit matters forever, forever. And I love his disciples, they go, why would we leave? Where would we go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. We have to learn what it means to feed on Jesus. And he even makes it super uncomfortable for us. And he doesn't even care. <laughs> he would much rather have the ones who go, I am willing to be uncomfortable.
I am willing to do whatever it takes and believe you and look like a fool again and again and again. I will willing, I'm saying this for me, I will willingly look like a fool for him again and again and again and again and again if it's for the love of my friends and my family and it's for him. I will believe him to the end. Because he did it all first. He laid it all down. He laid himself down. And he says, way more than what you physically eat, you need to learn what it means. You need to learn what my body and my blood does. You need to learn it. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, it says, Paul's trying to, to share with the church what communion's all about because they're kind of getting it wrong. And in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. Verse 26 says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I used to kind of struggle with communion. I've said this before, but I, you know, it's, well, what's the point? <laughs> like, cool. So, and I, I really limited it to just being, oh, okay, we're just remembering what Jesus did. That's cool, but don't we do that all the time in church, you know? But I think there's actually something so much more spiritual and so much more powerful because he says as you do this as you as you break the bread as you eat the cracker as you as you stop you're remembering that his body was broken for you for the forgiveness of your sins for your healing for your emotional healing his body was broken so that when you break your body with addiction or sin or finding love in the wrong places or connecting yourself to people that you shouldn't or putting your body in places where it shouldn't be or seeing things, all of that, he goes, remember that my body broke so that you don't have to pay the consequences of those things. My body broke so that you can be whole and healed. And then he says, and when you drink the cup, it's the blood of the new covenant. Do you guys know how awesome the new covenant is? Like, can you imagine if we were still in the old covenant? where it's like follow a million rules and when you mess up even once, you gotta go and like offer these sacrifices and it's all blessings and curses, blessings and curses. If you can keep up, you're blessed. And if you can't, you're cursed. And guess what? The people chose that, God didn't. But he goes, because you chose that and I didn't, I'm gonna offer you a better covenant and you can't, Cody always says this and I love it, you can't mess it up because it's not us and him, it's the father and the son. And we just enter in through Jesus. This is what communion's all about. It's us partaking in the fact that I'm going, I would mess this up every single time. Every single time. But because of Jesus, I get to come and partake of his body and his blood. And in that, I enter into a new covenant between father and son, and they will never mess it up. And I get to find all all that is involved with Jesus' cross, death on the cross and his resurrection, everything that was involved with him being beaten. He didn't have to be beaten for our sins to be forgiven. He was beaten so that we could have wholeness. And 
when we take communion, it's not just remembering what he did. It's actually entering into that. It's entering into that. It's actually going, I enter into the death that Jesus died and I receive everything that he won. And I enter into his resurrection and I receive everything that is in the new covenant, the new covenant of his blood, that it's completely up to him and all we have to do is keep ourselves in him. All we have to do is keep bringing ourselves to him. No matter how broken or beat up or full of joy or whatever we are, we just keep putting ourselves under his blood. And the other thing that's incredible about communion It says you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And we can actually, as we take communion, we can take it not only for ourselves, but we can declare his body and his blood over circumstances in our lives, over people in our lives. I know people who take, and I, I'm going to be one of those people because I've learned so much more about communion, but I know people who take communion several times a day. Anytime God puts somebody on their heart, they go and they take communion for that person, declaring the body and the blood over that person. We have the authority that Jesus has given us, and this is one of the most beautiful tools. And we need to make sure we never just make it a symbol like we can with so many other things. We need to, as we sit, and we're going to invite you guys up in, the, in, in these next two, time, uh, two songs. As we close out today, we're going to invite you to come up and just come up slowly, just one person at a time. We don't need to make a line or anything, but just when you're ready, come up. You can kneel or you can stand at the sides if it's hard to kneel. But take time. Don't just do it as this act, but take time. Ask God, what is it that I need to come and put under your blood? God, what is it that I still need healing or help for. God, is there anyone else that I can put under your body and your blood today? And take time and let him serve you in this. Because remember what he did right before he did this, showed us what communion is? Before he had done any of it, he washes his disciples' feet, showing them what it is to serve and saying, I will get down on my hands and knees and I will serve you whenever you need it. The God of the universe <laughs> who spoke and galaxies were created. And then he gets down on his hands and knees and he says, I will serve you when you need it. Jesus, we just, we pray for a deeper revelation for each of us today in what it means to feed on you. God, just help us to break the junk that tells us we only ever need to, you know, show up to church once a week and that's good enough. We need you every day. We need you every moment of every day. God, just give us a deeper revelation of what it meant that your body was broken for us. God, give us a deeper revelation of the new covenant of your blood. That when you see us, we are literally covered by the blood of Jesus and we are called righteous. And some of you don't feel righteous. It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what you feel. What matters is that you step into the reality. You, you renounce the lies and you accept the truth that that is who you are if you've given yourself to Jesus. And if you haven't, if you haven't, then I actually want you to come. I'm just gonna sit on the side. I'll pray with you. We'll have some other leaders ready to pray with you if you need to give your life to Jesus today or if you need help breaking addictions or whatever it is. But Jesus... Today is heavy, but I, I, that's okay. <laughs> Could
because what you did for us was heavy. But God, we also pray that as we get off our knees today, that you would fill us with your peace, that you would fill us with your joy, that you would fill us with fire, a fire to fight, because I'm so done seeing the devil win. Jesus, we declare that you are the victory. You are the victory. We love you, Lord. Amen.